keep learning. Never stop learning. Never stop reading. You know, Lincoln was totally self-educated. He barely went to school in his whole life. He learned by just learning all the time. Hi, my name is Karina Macosco from AcademicInfluence.com, and I am here with Professor Foner. And we just want to know, how did you get into your field and what influenced you to go there? How did I get into my field? Well, uh, it's uh, pr probably a long story, which I'll try to make brief. <laughs> I should say I grew up in a family in the suburbs of New York City back in the 1950s, uh, a family in which um, history was a, a part of my growing up. Uh, my father was a historian. My uncle Philip was a historian. We frequently talked about figures in American history over the dinner table, things like that. <laughs> So it seems inevitable I'd be a historian, but the fact is, actually, I was much more interested in high school, in science, in math, in, uh, I wanted to actually be an astronomer. And when I went oh, to college, wow. yeah, the first two years in college, I mostly took physics, math, um, astronomy, things like that. Uh, somewhere in the middle, though, I decided to change over to history. And I think the reason, there were two reasons. One, uh, I had a, I took a course with a very inspiring teacher uh, on the whole Civil War era, and it shows you that a teacher can really uh, affect your whole life. Really. Right. He, he got yeah. me really fascinated by this piece of history. And secondly, this was the early 1960s, and the Civil Rights Movement was at its height, um, and I was somewhat involved in that. My brother was quite involved in it. Uh, and um, I, I and many, many people of my generation wanted to figure out where this came from. You know, the history, we had learned history in high school, of course, but it was, uh, how shall I put it? It was a history that could not have produced the present that we were living in. It was a history based on the idea that all the problems were solved pretty much in American <laughs> society. Uh, maybe there are a few tweaks needed here and there, but, you know, it was a kind of general uh Onward and upward, America was born perfect and then had been getting better ever since. <laughs> right. um, this could not explain why thousands of people were in the streets demanding their rights, fighting against inequality. And so uh, many of us decided, you know, I got interested in the history of the anti-slavery movement before the Civil War, uh, the politics of anti-slavery, things like that. Uh, so it was a combination of personal upbringing uh, a teacher, and just the world I was living in that sort of all conspired to make me decide to become a historian. And so now, do you study mostly the Civil War period, or do you study other periods too? I Most, most of my books have been about the Civil War era, broadly defined. Uh, 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 about, I wrote a book about Abraham Lincoln. I've written several books about the Reconstruction era after the Civil War. My doctoral dissertation, which was then published as my first book, was about the Republican Party before the Civil War. So, yes, most of my scholarship has been on uh, that period broadly defined, the Civil War era, which begins way before the Civil War and stretches long after it. But I have also written on other aspects of American history as well. And um, I know that my history classes now are probably very different from the ones you took when you were in college or high school. I hope and, so. Yeah. They weren't yeah. very good in, in high school anyway. Yeah. Yeah. So do you think that um, there's kind of been a shift away from, like you were saying, America was born great and just has been getting greater? Uh, do you think there was a shift away from it? Or how do you think history classes have changed a little? Oh, absolutely. I mean, history, you know, now, look, it's easy enough to say when I was in high school, they weren't teaching it well, but that was, you know, over 50 years ago. So I'm not trying right. to condemn my poor high school history <laughs> teachers. Um, but yes, the fact, I mean, if you look at American history textbooks now, um, they're much more diverse. They deal with the diversity of American society. And my, I went back and looked at my high school textbook. There was no black American mentioned by name in my high school textbook. Frederick wow. Douglass was not mentioned. I mean, this was a very, actually very narrow 
vision of American history. Today, it's entirely different. You know, it's a much more diversified vision, and it's a, it's a story of ups and downs, as most countries' history is, of progress and then retrogression, of rights gained and sometimes rights lost. Um, I, I think, the, and it's about struggles, people struggling to uh, make this a better society. And I think that's a much more interesting and certainly more accurate uh, history than the uh, kind of just, um, I think, um, simplistic one that was taught when I was there. But the other point is that the teachers are different today. Uh, right. In my entire life, I never had an African-American teacher, never, of any subject. I never, I never had a woman history teacher. I had women teachers in other subjects. Um, and so in other words, today, the history profession is far more diversified, and that has affected so, for example, the history of women in American society was just not mentioned when I was uh, in school, but now it's a major subfield. That is partly because we now have many women scholars who are active historians and active right. teachers. So, yeah, but I think, you know, I think this is good. I think the way history is taught and understood now is um, uh, far more sophisticated than it was when I was learning in in um in high school. So again, I don't want to condemn Mrs. Bertha Berryman, my high school <laughs> history teacher, although I think many of her views do seem a little antiquated nowadays. But, um, you know, I think the study of history has progressed enormously since then. And do you think there's still a lot of people who un are underrepresented or just not represented at all in history that might change um, in the future? Well, uh, yes, I think, you know, th there's a problem with that situation in that um, most of the records that historians are used to using come from a certain elite in the society. Right. You know, it's the your ordinary man or woman in the street of any race or background is often not leaving, uh, you know, letters, speeches, publications, the kinds of things that historians like to use to you know, delve into a particular period. So there, there's a problem of the archive, as we as we call it. And then to complement that or to exacerbate it, uh, if if you go to the uh, you know Library of Congress or to other you know historical libraries, um, you know over the many many years they have been mostly interested in collecting the records of famous prominent people. So if you wanted to study Thomas Jefferson, you'd have a gigantic array. Of material, but if you want to study the lives of Jefferson slaves, let's say, then it becomes a little more complicated. Although people have done it and done it very well, so um, there's always an, a, a a battle to sort of uncover the history of more, you know the less prominent figures in American in American history. Um, one group whose history has often been obscured but is now being studied by many scholars is Native Americans. You know, when I was, when I was in school, Native Americans appeared in our history basically as just an obstacle to, um, you know, uh, westward movement or things like that. In other words, they didn't have their own history. They just was sort of had to be pushed out of the way. Maybe it was not done very pleasantly, but you know, they were there and then they were pushed out and white settlers and everything moved in. Um, to, to that's Today, I think that we have a much more complicated view of that, but also, again, finding the records uh, of Native Americans. It's not impossible. It is done. There are good scholars doing it, but it's uh, a challenge. That's all. Right. And do you think that there are also different sides of people who you studied in your history books that are being uncovered, like people we've been studying um, forever, but now we're kind of seeing a different uh, side of them and a lot of times like a not so good side of their policies or who they were. I, yeah. I'm not one of those who says we should just start tearing down the reputation right. of everybody. Right. But, you know, uh, yes, I think um, <laughs> many prominent figures in our history have turned out to be a little more problematic than uh, earlier historians emphasized. I mean, even a person like Abraham Lincoln, one of our greatest Americans, um, 
uh, let us say, for much of his life, shared some of the prejudices against black people that were very common in his um, in his era and in his state, Illinois. Um, you know, that's important. That those kinds of things were not really mentioned much. Or Jefferson again. What about Jefferson's uh, owning of slaves and his relationship with his slave Sally Hemings and things like that? Um, You know, this is not to say, well, that's all we need to know about Jefferson. Of course, there were great achievements of men like Jefferson and Lincoln. But we have to sort of, nobody is perfect in this world, you know. And if you, I don't care who they are. And if you you set out to sort of just have a history of heroes, it becomes a rather... um, uh, it becomes inaccurate after a while. I think it's better to see the pros, the pluses and minuses of any human being, you know? Yeah. Well, uh, kind of switching gears a little bit, a lot of people who come to this website are high schoolers like me or college students who are trying to figure out what they want to do. And you said that um, in high school you thought you would go into something in science or math and then kind of switch to history. So could you kind of give us your advice on what somebody should do if they think they want to go into history or they're not sure or they don't want to go into history at all but uh, maybe should give it a shot? Well, it's it's hard for me to give advice to young people in the facing the many uncertainties that uh, we all face in our society today. You know, my, my view is to try to keep an open mind and don't assume that you're not interested in something. As I said, I, I learned to love history partly through a teacher who I happened to take his course. That was sort of accidentally. I, I, you know, I heard <laughs> that he was very good, etc. cetera. Um, but um, keep an open mind and don't just study what you think you want to do. In other words, when I was, I've retired, but when I was a college professor, I had students who I advised and, you know, sometimes most of them were history majors, but they would come in, here's my course uh, choices for this year. And I, it was like four history courses and <laughs> sociology. I said, no, that's no, you can't do that. Take at least one course on something that you have no practical, that you don't think has any practical value for you. Take a course on Shakespeare. Take a course on uh, Renaissance Italian art. Take a course on Chinese history. I don't <laughs> care. But something that's outside of your comfort zone. And you never know how it may influence you or inspire you or anything like that. So um, I think one thing you can learn from Abraham Lincoln, if I might invoke him, is, and this is not just in school, this is forever, your whole life, keep learning. Never stop learning. Never stop reading. You know, Lincoln was totally self-educated. He barely went to school in his whole life. He learned by just learning all the time. He wanted to do that. And never be just totally satisfied. Always be interested in new ideas, new things. And then you'll develop insights and skills that will serve you well no matter what line of work you end up in. Wow, well, that is incredible advice. So thank you so much for taking the time uh, to talk with me. It was really a pleasure to hear what you had to say. So thank you so much. You're you're very welcome. Very nice to talk to you. (laughs) Thanks.